You know, pain is a lonesome place. I don't have to tell you, do I? It'll drop a rock in your stomach right through your pounding heart. And when your knees are so weak, you hit the ground and you finally realize you don't got this. Well, now you might just make it. You see, the tallest tree may not weather the storm, but its roots do. So dig in, stand up, and let the wind blow. Because there's hope. you go ahead and grab a seat this morning. Man, you guys uh, sound great, and I'm so enthusiastic about your uh, engagement this morning, and uh, if that's at any level of where we're going to be today, then uh, you might want to be ready uh, and buckle up for what God has in store for us. If you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to grab those and open them up to Genesis 39. If you don't have a copy of God's Word, we'll have some on the screens for you, and then if you've got a phone, you can just pull out your phone and uh, get your Bible app, and you can find that there. It's really important. Uh, that you do grab a copy of God's Word because I want you to know that we don't make this up. We're not writing this this week. Uh, And uh, this was written thousands and thousands of years ago and has stood the test of time uh, throughout generations. And uh, the Word of God will stand forever no matter what happens. And so I want you to see that with your own two eyes. As a matter of fact, I want to share with you a quick story. I didn't plan on saying it necessarily today, but later I was meeting with somebody this week and we were talking about last Sunday and uh, we were sitting in my office, and uh, her heart was so moved uh, by what God is speaking to her over the last several weeks uh, that uh, she said, listen, I, I feel like I'm faithful to the Lord. Uh, I feel like God is, uh, that God's using me, and, uh, but uh, he's calling me to be in his word. And she said, you know what? I need to go get a Bible. And so this last week, she went out and bought a Bible and said, man, I wanna see this right now with my own two eyes in God's word, and that's important. And so I wanna encourage you with that same thing. If you don't have a Bible, man, go grab one. Amazon's legit, okay? So just go to Amazon, prime that sucker right away. You could prime it right now. Everybody grab your phone if you don't have one, and you can maybe have it by the end of tomorrow. Uh, And, uh, but anyway, for the record, just so you know, I actually teach out of the ESV Bible. So if you wanna go get one of those and follow along with me, feel free to do that. It's just the one I like to teach out of. You can pick whatever, well, not whatever you want. We can talk about that afterwards. But uh, anyway, uh, just to follow along with me, that'd be a great way to do that. Um, I was doing some research and found out that there are some random warning labels on some pretty interesting products. Uh, Did you guys know there, let me just kind of throw these out here. Some of them are are pretty funny actually, uh, but there are warning labels on everything these days, even on hair dryers. Uh, One of the little nuggets on the hair dryer, like a little bullet point under there is uh, warning, do not use while sleeping. Thanks for the advisement, I appreciate that. Um, Another one, this is funny, um, uh, on a carton of eggs, uh, eggs, it says this product may contain eggs. Uh, That's awesome. Uh, And this is real, Uh, you know those like little razor scooters? Um, that, that says on their warning, this product moves when used. Uh, that's pretty great. And then, uh, honestly, like uh, on, these, uh, on a small tractor like John Deere, uh, this, I checked, it's not on my mower, but it is on some other mowers. It says, uh, please avoid death. So uh, thanks for the warning. I appreciate that. Uh, but warnings are awesome, aren't they? Like if you really think about it, warnings there to help prevent us kind of from falling off of the edge. Uh, they're like, kind of like guardrails for us. And uh, in a community where we got windy roads and, I mean, hills everywhere, those guardrails are there uh, for you and for me to protect us from falling off uh, the cliff and going to our oblivion. And uh, what I would want to suggest is, wouldn't it be awesome uh, if temptation in our life had warning labels? Like just flashing at us like, hey, don't go there. Uh, If you, listen, this might ruin your marriage. Hey, this might ruin your job. You might lose your job. Uh, If you go that direction, your kid is gonna follow in your footsteps. You think it just ends with you, but it doesn't end with you. It's got like a generational thing that just they learn from their dad or they learn from their mom and they're really catching that and they're observing you. And so be careful, be careful. Who wouldn't want some warning labels with their temptation and sin? Like five of us, that's awesome. So everybody's got victory over this today. Thank you. Come on, don't leave me up here by myself. I'll drag you up here, okay? 
All right, all right. So yes, we all want those warning labels. And uh, I, I think today, my goal for us as we're in this series, Hope in the Dark, if I can just put this really clear right out front, uh, my goal for us through God's word is to see that God actually has provided through the story of a man named Joseph some warning signs for us. And the interesting piece is, is that your spiritual enemy, he's patient, but he's not very smart. He has been doing the same thing since the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3. And so you've fallen to it, I've fallen to it. Listen, this has happened in our lives. This is real, and this is super, super, super practical. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna jump into Genesis 3, and I don't have a lot of time to give you context, but if you just wanna go pick up on the story of Joseph, this guy has been through the ringer. Now, this is not like the Joseph from Mary and Joseph. This is Joseph from the Old Testament. And uh, the story goes is he's got a long line of brothers, and his brothers hated him. He was a dreamer, and uh, he had all these dreams, and he thought he was, they thought that he thought he was spiritually superior because of that, that wasn't the truth. They sold him into, threw him in a pit, sold him into slavery. He winds up being in the Pharaoh's house in Egypt, and that's where, uh, in Potiphar's house in Egypt, where he was a servant of Pharaoh. And that's where we find the story today. I wish I had more time to tell you all the ins and outs of the story of Joseph, but I don't have time for that today. So Genesis 39, uh, and beginning in verse one. Are you with me? Thank you, I appreciate that, here we go. Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt and, uh, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had brought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph and he became a successful man and he was in the house of, the Egyptian, of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. And he made him an overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had had. From that time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he'd had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he'd had in his house and his field. This is kind of a funny verse right here. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. I think that's pretty funny. Now, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance, and after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph and said, lie with me, but he refused and said to his master's wife, behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house. And he has put everything that he has in my charge. He's not greater, he is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you're his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And she spoke to Joseph day after day. He would not listen to her, to lie beside her, or to be with her. Verse 11, but one day when he went into the house to do his work and none of the men were in the house, uh, were, were there in the house. She caught him by his garment saying, lie with me, but he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. And as soon as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled out of the house, she called the men of her household and said to them, check this out. She, see, he has, her husband, has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came in to lie with me and I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that, I lifted up my voice and I cried out. He left his garment beside me and fled and got, had gone, got out of the house, verse 16. Then she laid up his garment by her until his master came home. And she told him, the master, the same story, saying, the Hebrew servant whom you brought among us came in to me to laugh at me. But as soon as I lifted up my voice, and cried out, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. As soon as his master heard these words that his wife had spoken to him, this is, uh, this is the way that your servant treated me, his anger was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in prison, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison but, uh, put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in prison. Whatever he uh, was, was done there, he was the one that did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him 
and whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. Joseph was a man who was confronted with a pretty precarious situation. He was confronted with an opportunity to lean in or lean, not lean in. Was he going to fall or was he going to be an overcomer? What we know about the story now that we've already looked at it is that he was an actual overcomer, but we're going to learn some pretty powerful things today. Actually, we're going to learn uh, two questions that we're going to ask and we're going to answer them fully. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go through this and through the first section, we're going to look and we're going to ask the question, what is temptation's technique? What is temptation's technique? Maybe another way to say that would be is how does this whole thing play out? How does temptation work in a person's life? And we're gonna come through the text with that filter in mind. So that's the question that we're, that's the kind of the glasses we're all looking at as we're going through this story. We're saying, hey, how does temptation come at us? How does this whole thing work? And then on the other side of that, the logical next question is then, okay, sweet. Now I know all those details. How do I actually overcome this thing? So those are the two filters that we're gonna come at this story with and I'm telling you by God's grace, we're gonna walk out of here and you're gonna now have a framework. We are gonna have a framework to find hope in the darkness that sometimes, can we be real, we created. Some of us are walking in a tough time today. We're walking through the muck and the mire of our circumstances because we put ourselves there because we were met with an opportunity to either choose to follow Christ or to choose to live in disobedience and fall into sin and into temptation. That's real. That's your story, by the way. That's your pastor's story. That's a human experience that we all walk through. And so my hope and prayer is if we can see this thing coming earlier in our life, earlier in the process, maybe we could save ourselves from some of the pain and the heartache that we've walked through in our lives. Are you with me? Okay, so here's the first question. What is temptation's technique? The first thing it involves is this idea called look. I'd like to actually say in in a different way, it involves looking, looking. Temptation comes at you and me by this first phase and this first stage, and it comes at us from looking. Can I give you a little caveat before I go any further? I know I like to hoot and holler and yell and get you guys fired up, and I like that too. Today's gonna be a little more teachy. Are you down with that? You down with that? Give you some practical help here? Give you, and I might get a little fired up. We'll just see. We'll see what God does. But look at verse six. Verse six, well, let me just give you this. Joseph was a good looking man. Like he was a looker. He was a handsome guy. He got it from his mama. His mom, was a, she was very, very beautiful. And his dad was smitten the first time he ever saw her and he waited a long time to marry this woman. And so he then inherited his mama's good looks and he was a handsome young man. And um, he caught the eye of Potiphar's wife. He caught the eye of Potiphar's wife. And the scripture says in verse six, after some time, after some time, you need to circle that phrase. After some time, then verse seven says, that's actually verse seven, after some time, his master's wife caught, or I'm sorry, cast her eyes on Joseph. She was casting her eyes on Joseph. Now, what we don't know, if we just take it at face value, is how long this moment has happened. Interestingly enough, if you do a little bit of history, Joseph has actually been in the house for 10 years. He's been in this situation for 10 years. He'd been rubbing shoulders with the housemaids. He'd been there just doing what he was doing, running the household, and after about 10 years of constantly looking, Potiphar's wife was smitten with him. She just caught him out of the corner of her eye and she couldn't stop looking. Have you ever been there? They just couldn't get it out of your mind. You just caught it and it was just a moment. Like, listen, I'm not even just talking about, I know you're where your mind goes, you immediately go to the big things. I'm talking you couldn't get dessert out of your mind and you knew you were already full, but you're a glutton for punishment, full pun intended. And you just give in. That's, it's, it's from the little stuff to the stuff that you know you shouldn't look at. It's all of it and everything in between. All of that is a moment for you to be faithful or a moment for you and me to fall. And so it starts with this idea of looking. And she had been there for about 10 years. And the language tells us uh, that um, this was enough time for this woman to look and then to have her, this is the phrasing, passions inflamed. That's what looking does. To have your passions inflamed. 
Several years, it was about a year ago, I was preaching on a Sunday at this last church, last church that I was at, and I am fully convinced, even to this very morning I was praying about it, that it was the enemy coming at me uh, with something, but I had this uh, toothache that flared up, and it was literally, I, 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 it was so bad that it was shooting pain down into my shoulder. I had pain all up in my head. I, I mean, Joy, she can attest to this. I was literally thinking I was gonna die. It was that painful. I went to the dentist the next day. He's like, man, we need to get that sucker extracted. It's like $4 million. I was like, I'll just die. I'll just go to heaven. It's fine. You know, but they gave me some shots and I was good. But I, I, that feeling of inflamed, that, 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 that what was going on around the root of my tooth. And that was infection. And that's what happens when you and I look and we get stirred. Infection begins to brood on the inside of us. It all begins with looking and it's this idea of having our attention caught. Getting our our attention dragged away. Church, this is exactly how we lead ourselves down the path of destruction. When we allow a look and then we look some more, and then we, we look some more, and then we look some more, and then we wonder why we fall. But if you know that it starts here, you can better arm yourself with the tools that we'll talk about here in just a few moments. We must become more aware of how temptation works, that it starts with looking. Secondly, it moves on to the next level, and looking actually moves into logically into progression, into longing. Looking into longing, you, you long for, for something. Listen, I've been l- looking at trucks for a long time. Well, ask Joy. I got about 15 of them bookmarked on do- cars.com right now. And uh, now there is all kinds of reasons why I need a truck because it snows and ice is here and I need four-wheel drive. I'm convincing myself that I need that. And now it's at the point where I'm longing for a truck now. And I've got the right color. I got the right interior that I want. This is what I want. I had no reason to need that in Arizona because it never, it doesn't do anything, but it's sweltering. That's it. So you don't need four-wheel drive. But here, you need it. And th- here, my point is if you understand anything like that, then you understand what longing is like. Ladies, when you look at that purse you want, come on now. You see, you, do, you book, uh, you know, uh, whatever they do that deal on Pinterest where you post it to your board. You got this dream board that you're going after. That is called longing. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying it's, it is. That's what it is. And that in the wrong direction can send you into a tailspin of sin that you will regret for the rest of your life. And we all understand that, don't we? We understand what longing is like. Look at the passage in verse seven, the second part. It says, he was casting her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me. Lie with me. She had gotten to the point where the looking was enough and she finally took it to the next level. Her craving, it manifested itself into an invitation. It manifested itself into an invitation, which was an invitation into an adulterous relationship. Oh, that we would pay attention to our appetites. We all have them. We all have appetites for things and oh, that we would pay attention to what we are longing for in that moment sooner so that we don't fall off of the cliff. And by the way, on the other side of the cliff, there is not some padding there to catch you. The enemy wants that destruction. Now, if you're in Christ today, there is a little bit of a cushion there and it's called grace, but he wants utter destruction for you and for me, our spiritual enemy does. And so if he can get you to look and he can get you to long, he's headed in the right direction. Can I just say this to you today? Longing always leads us to sin's doorstep. Longing will always put us onto the doorstep of opportunity, good ways and bad ways. If you're a dreamer and you long to be successful in your life and you long to make an impact in this world, that puts you on the doorstep of opportunity. But in the negative sense, On the other side of that same coin, longing for things that are not yours, longing for a spouse that is not yours, longing for a fix that only Jesus can fill in your soul will put you on the doorstep of opportunity. And I want us to be very aware of where we're standing today. I can't answer that question for you, but what doorstep are you standing on today? Where has your appetite directed your life I'm pretty convinced that if you show me your appetite I'll show you where you're going to land 
It starts with looking and it moves into this area of longing and then it takes a a kind of a, a hard turn into lingering. Looking and longing and lingering. Look at verse 10. Verse 10 goes on and says, and she, this is Potiphar's wife. I find it fascinating that we don't get her name, right? It's just Potiphar's wife. I wish there was a name there. You can call her Sally, I don't know. Uh, But verse 10 says, and she spoke uh, to Joseph day after day, day after day. Circle that phrase, day after day. She came at him day after day. Now let me explain what lingering is like. I like to make salsa, okay? I love to make salsa. And I've got this uh, homemade salsa that I'm just gonna be honest with you, I've perfected. I'm just being real, not gonna lie to you. And uh, I've perfected it. It's probably been, I don't know, maybe like eight years. Well, it's been a long time. I've been trying to perfect this thing for eight years. And, um, and so I've, I've got it like, people ask, can I have it? You can't have it. As a matter of fact, I did give it to Tyler, uh, our family pastor, and he screws it up every time he makes it. Uh, I'm just messing with you. I love you, Tyler. But, uh, uh, but it, there's, a, there's just a thing about it. There's a thing that uh, there's some, and I'm not gonna tell you the secret, okay? Uh, but there's some secrets in there. And what's interesting, though, is that when you make salsa or, or you like hot stuff, you like jalapenos, uh, and I like that. And so uh, I'll tell you this. I put anywhere from two to three, depending on how firm the jalapeno is. That's a secret. So how firm the jalapeno is, that's a secret. So I cut this jalapeno up and I, I, I do all the deal and I make the salsa and then uh, we all sit down and we eat tacos and we put, you know, we just douse all the stuff with salsa and we, we just love it. We clean up and by the time we're done with that, we sit down uh, and Joy and I are doing whatever we're doing and I wear contacts. I fiddle with my eyes all the time and I got dry eyes. It's just the way that it is and I rub my eye. Listen, I already washed my hands, okay? I know what you're thinking, but I, I'm thinking I'm good. I am totally not good. Not good, why? Because that jalapeno oil is on my hands and I, even though I scrubbed my hands and I was helping clean up the dishes and all that stuff, there was a little bit of residue that was still left on my hands and it lasted a whole lot longer than I thought it was gonna last. And I'm sitting, literally, we're Googling. I remember this, we were Googling this one time where uh, like my eye, I felt like my eyes were gonna fall out of my face. They were so burning, so bad. We're splashing milk on my eyeballs, guys. I mean, it is just at the point of no return. And if you understand this idea of what jalapeno oil does in your hand and how it stays on longer than you want it to and you can't get rid of it, that's what lingering was like. That's the idea of lingering. Like you, you just, uh, it, it's always around. You, don't, you can't always see it, but it's got an effect on you. And that's what Potiphar's wife was like. She was like this incessant, super annoying jalapeno oil that everybody, like J- Joseph thought he was good, but he wasn't good. She was incessant day by day, constantly lingering, constantly coming around. around. We're, we don't get the whole story of was she, you know, off in the kitchen waiting on him to come in there. Uh, were they walking down the hall? way and he saw her and they had that moment and he walks the other way and he runs the other way we don't know all the details but we know that we're humans and so I'm pretty sure that when her mind was made up she was going to do everything she could in around every corner to find every trap to try to get this guy to be with her now what's interesting is is that your spiritual enemy is just like that my spiritual enemy is just like that the devil is a lingerer I mean, he is looking, the scripture tells us, around every corner. He's prowling around every corner and he's waiting and he's like a wild, savage animal. The scripture tells us that he wants to pounce on a believer. He wants to pounce on you and me. He wants to literally steal everything we have, kill all of our dreams, and destroy our lives. That is your spiritual enemy's plan for your life. That's what he wants for you. And at the end of the day, what the devil wants more than anything is not to keep a lost person lost because he's already won the battle. He wants to keep a saved follower of Jesus Christ in bondage in sin for a long time. That's his plan. And so he's gonna linger around every corner to make sure that you and I have opportunities to fall into temptation, into sin, and to, in our words, blow it. And here's what you and I need to understand, that he is a patient devil. He's patient. I love what 1 Peter tells us about this, though. Peter obviously had dealt with something in his mind. Obviously, we knew he had a big mouth, and he put his foot in his mouth all the time. And there might be, you know, that's probably a temptation of pride, of ego. I got all the answers, so just let me talk first. You know that guy? We all know that guy or girl. 
And so your thing might not be looking at things you're not supposed to. Your thing might be ego. And you might be tempted to grab control like Peter did. And Peter says this, resist the devil. Resist him. He says it over here in, um, in, uh, in, in 1 Peter 5, 9. Resist the devil. Stand firm in your faith. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to this eternal glory in Christ will himself, listen to this, restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. So even if you do fall in that moment, the good news of the gospel is that, listen, you don't have to be perfect because you follow one who is perfect and his name is Jesus. Even if you do blow it, the Bible tells us that you can be confirmed, that you can be strengthened, and this is awesome. You can be restored by the power of the gospel in your life. But that doesn't negate the fact that at the very beginning, there is, it's called an imperative command. He's saying resist, like a military sergeant would say to his soldiers. Resist. Resist. So there's a looking, a longing, a lingering, and then it moves into a lashing out. Do you all know this in your life? Have you experienced that? Just think, think back to your personal history and where you've been tempted and customize that to your life. Think about your life. Didn't it have a moment where it lashed out at you? Of course it did. Every time, amen to that. Joseph got a little too crazy to this, a little too close to this crazy woman and she lashed out and she grabbed his robe, verse 12, look at it. Verse 12 says, she caught him by his garment. I would say, everybody say too close, <laughs> too close. Listen, listen, listen. When you flirt with sin, you flirt with pain, just so you know that. That was too close. Too close for my comfort. Some of us need to draw the line and step about 85 million miles back behind that line because listen, when we get too close, listen, I know it. I know you're bold and you're awesome. You're not as awesome as you think you are though, okay? Because neither am I. And I know that what we do in our lives is we have a tendency to kind of flirt with the line a little bit. I know I'm meddling and I understand it, but look at your kid. Look at your kid and your kid proves that we all meddle. And not, not that we all meddle, that we all flirt with lines. My children flirt with that line of, uh, you know, that where they, they think they're being cute, but they're really being disrespectful. Who's with me on that? You got that kid in your house? Let's all resolve right now. They're getting grounded today. They're just starting today. <laughs> they're like, what for? Who doesn't matter? I'm your parent. You're being grounded. Sometimes I feel like that's the best way to wake up in the morning. It's Monday, you're grounded. <laughs> I have no idea what for, but you're grounded. Well, it's because you're going to flirt with a line sometime this week and you're going to push it. I'm glad God's not like that. Aren't you glad God's not like that? Spiritually ground you before you ever get started. Well, this lady was way too close. He got way too close to this lady and she was a trickster and she lashed out. She reached out and she grabbed his garment and uh, ripped it right off of him. Did you know the devil's up to the very same tricks today? He does the same thing to you and me. You ever, were you ever just driving to work? You're sitting in a meeting. You're buying groceries. Out of nowhere, something pops into your mind. You ever had that moment? Anybody? Honest moment in church? Yep, yeah, me too, right? What is that? That's the devil lashing out. That's him coming right at you. And he's appealing, listen, listen, loved ones, this is great. He's appealing to your humanity. He's appealing to your humanity saying, in your human flesh, oh man, that would be legit. That would be great. I need that. That's awesome. I'd like to have that. In that moment, that would make me feel better. Listen, I just got chewed out by my wife. I just got chewed out by my boss. Everything's going downhill real fast. It's like I'm snow skiing in Denver or wherever you snow ski. And this is what's happening. And it's downhill quick and I'm like a freight train out of control. And it would make me feel better if I did that. He's banking on your humanity winning out. But did you know that the Bible tells us that greater is he that is in me than the one that is in the world? And you have the power of the resurrected Christ inside of you. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, that's what Peter is saying. Resist. You can't do it on your own strength. You might do CrossFit, but you can't do that. But you can resist in the power of the Holy Spirit. And you can resist the lashing out. And by God's grace, in the resistance, like working out, you build strength. And then it becomes an ever-increasing joy to resist. You're like, devil, you ain't got me. 
And you get stronger in that, not by your own strength, but by exercising your faith, like you exercise your biceps, like you exercise those muscles. When you exercise the action of faith and belief that God is better, that God is more satisfying than this thing, that exercises a muscle in your spiritual body that allows you to lean into Christ, to lean into the things of God, and to resist the devil. And he, guess what? At the resistance, the Bible says that he will flee. That's dang good news. And it's good news because this is real. Like this is where hope meets dark, right here. Can I just give you another little source of encouragement? The devil works like a fisherman. This is free. When you go to Cabela's or you go to Bass Pro, I want you next time you're there to go to the area where all of the bait and the tackle, where they they sell that. And I just want you to ask, hey, I want to go, just go Google a fish you want to catch. And say, hey, what kind of bait do I need to catch that? And some little 14-year-old girl who knows about fishing is going to walk you over to the lure. You're going to feel like an idiot if you're a guy. You're like, I should know about this. But I have a pocket knife. I don't know how to catch a fish, but I sure do got a pocket knife. You know, that makes me a man, right? This 14-year-old girl is going to show me how to catch this particular fish, and so she's going to go over there and show you, and she goes, oh, okay. So that's that kind of bait to get that kind of fish. Do you know what else they call baits? Lures. Wow, fascinating. Do you know why they call them lures? Because they're luring the fish in to bite the bait, and what does a fisherman do as soon as that lure feels a tug? Yank it. That is lashing out. Your spiritual enemy is patient like a fisherman and he's got just the right bait to grab your attention. That flicker in the water, that flicker in the moment, he knows your number, he knows mine too. He knows that thing that's constantly, every time it rings you pick up the phone, that thing, he knows. And he works like that and what the Bible is explaining to us is explaining the process that he's got that lure And he's making it flash and he's trying to draw your attention to it. And as soon as you even get even remotely close and nibble on it, boom, and he's got you. But by the power of Christ, you can be dead to that. The book of Romans teaches us that you can be dead to that and you can have a funeral for that thing in your life today. I want you to say I'm dead to that. Say it. Like, say it like you actually believe that you're dead to that. I kind of believe you. You need to go home and read the book of Romans this week because then what you'll see is you'll see by the power of the gospel in your life that it's good enough to save you, but it's good enough to grow you. Like, man, yeah, you get eternal life, but you, when you have this gospel revolution in your soul, which is why we're gonna start a new series in a couple of weeks on the gospel, so that you and I can understand that, man, the gospel does save us, and we do receive eternal life and forgiveness of sin, but what's even better is when you have a gospel revolution in your heart, you're preaching the gospel to your life every day because you know that you are terrible and that you are a sinner and that you need a savior every day. And when you lean on the gospel realities of your heart, you'll realize even though that lure is coming at me, I believe the gospel is enough to overcome that. Jesus overcame that temptation while he was here in this world and I don't have to give in to that because he lives in here and I'm dead to that. Looking, longing, lingering, lashing out and finally it manifests itself in lies. Lies. So I already told you Potiphar's wife's a little crazy woman, right? She lies the whole way. The whole way. As soon as she calls those household, whoever, the servants in the household, look at uh, verse 12. It says that she caught him by his garment and said, lie with me. Remember, this is her for a long period of time pursuing this thing in Joseph. And verse 13, and as soon as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand, and had fled fled out of the house, she called to the men of her household and said to them, here's the lie, see, see, he, blame, blame shift, blame shift, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. 
Does that just feel out of place to anybody else but me? That feels weird to me. Why would she move to an emotional thing of he's coming to pick on us and laugh at us, really? Okay. He came to lie with me, not true, and I cried out with a loud voice. She goes on and tells him in verse 17 to her own husband, the Hebrew whom you've brought into us, blaming again, came in to me to laugh at me. Don't you feel bad for me? He came in to laugh at me. Really? But as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried out, he left the, his garment beside me and fled out of the house. Changing the small details of the story is lying. <laughs> Tweaking the details of the story is lying. And did you know that your spiritual enemy lies to you too about temptation? Two specific ways. He lies to you about sin. It's not that bad. Everybody does it. He'll even use the scripture against you. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So you should just go ahead. Everybody's already done it. Why not you? You've got grace. Don't worry about it. And he'll start trying to manipulate the scripture to you, which is a tactic he's been using forever to get at God's people. He lies to you about sin. It's not that bad. Nobody will know. It's private. Even if it's public, it's no big deal. It's not near as bad as them. Not near as bad as what she's doing or what, what he's doing. Like this is, like if there's like a, a hierarchy of, of issues, like dude, you're not even on the spectrum. But when you and I choose to sin, hear me, and I get no joy in saying this, but we choose to suffer. And the reason I can say that to you is because there have been seasons in my life where I've chosen sin, and I've chosen to suffer the consequences of that sin. Am I forgiven of that? Yes, by the shed blood of Christ, I'm forgiven of that. But that doesn't negate the consequence in reality in the human experience called life that I had to walk through. The devil doesn't just lie about sin, but he also lies about the sinner. He tries to tell you that because you did this, that's who you are. He tries to wrap your identity around what you have done. I've been walking through this with my oldest daughter, Sydney. She uh, is, man, I love watching her grow in the Lord, and she really struggles with the concept, and I don't think it's just her, I think it's us. She struggles with the concept of experiencing conviction and condemnation. Now, if you're in Christ Jesus today, Romans chapter 8, 1 tells us that if you're in Christ, therefore now and forever, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you're saved, you don't, get to, you don't have to experience condemnation, but the devil lies to you about that and makes you embrace what you did as who you are, and so you're walking in condemnation because of what I said, because of what I ingested into my body because of what I did to him or what I did to her or what I looked at or what I experienced. That's therefore what I am and I'm too dirty and too nasty for God to ever redeem. Listen, you need to feel the weight of the conviction of what we have done in our lives, but we do not need to bear, we do not need to bear the condemnation because that condemnation was actually poured out on the cross at Calvary on Christ. And God in his sovereignty, poured out the punishment for sin on Christ, which was his wrath. And he bore that condemnation on Jesus for you and for me so that upon the resurrection of Christ, you can stand before God by your expressed faith and trust in Jesus, freed from condemnation over what you've done in your life. And you don't have to believe one single word out of that devil liar's mouth ever again. He not only lies, but John tells us that he is the father of lies. He is the inventor of lies. Sometimes I feel like toddlers are the inventor of lies, but it was the devil himself was the inventor of lies. He fathered them. And you don't have to believe another word of it ever again. So my hope and prayer is as we answer this question, what is temptation's technique, that we understand the phasing. Do you see the logical sequence in your life? Can you get a situation in your mind right now of where you have bumped into this and it, it moves that sequential order from looking to longing, then it moves to this lingering and lashing out and then it moves into this area of lying. 
And my hope and prayer is that we can see this sequence a little further back in the process so that we can experience greater victory and greater victory and more hope. So then let's move to the second layer, and this moves really quick. How do I overcome? That's the logical progression. I, this is the issue. This is how it happens. How do I actually overcome? How do I find the hope in this? Are you ready for some hope today? Awesome. Hey, thank you for being, uh, being uh, very awesome today, leaning in. I really feel that today, and uh, let's, let's move into this deeper level here. How do I overcome? Are you ready? Number one, learn lessons. Learn lessons lessons. It had been some time since uh, Joseph sat on his daddy's lap and heard about his grandpa and great-grandpa. His grandpa was Isaac. His great-grandpa was Abraham. And God made a promise with Abraham that he would be a father of many nations. And through the story, there's some series of doubt in Abraham's life. And then God put him to the test and he asked him to sacrifice his own son. You can read about it. A little further pages, flip the pages a few areas here. And the Bible tells us that God provided a scapegoat for that sacrifice. And he wound up not sacrificing Isaac, his grandpa, but he wound up sacrificing a scapegoat. And God right there on that mountain made his covenant with Abraham that he would be the father of many nations, that he would father a great nation and that the seed of Jesus Christ would come out of his family. It's been a long time since he'd heard about his own dad's moment where he wrestled with God. Dad, why do you walk around with that limp? You know, Jacob had a limp. Couldn't figure out. Modern era, he was walking with a cane, guys. Why, are you, why is it like that for you, Dad? Well, because I wrestled with God all night long, and God won out, and I'm his forever. And it had been some time since he had those first dreams. His brothers got jealous of it and it, they threw him in a pit, dug, their pit, dug a pit, threw their younger brother in a pit. I must confess, there have been moments where I've wanted to throw my sibling into a pit too. But never did I get to the point where I wanted to sell them into slavery. And that is where they got to them. Their own flesh and blood sold them into slavery. It had been some time since all of these things had happened. And through his journey, he never got bitter. He just got better. Joseph never got bitter at the story of his life and the narrative that God created for him and allowed him to live out. He actually just took what God gave him and he learned the lessons. We see this. You have to dig in there and you see it in verse one where it says that now Joseph had been brought down. That phrase, been brought down, tells you a lot. From where? From everything I just told you. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 15, foolishness brings joy to the one without sense, but a man with understanding, learn the lessons, walks a straight path. Can I ask you a question? Has your past schooled you? Now some of you think about that negatively, but I want to think about it in the affirmative. Have you let your past school you? I'm not saying that you feel burned. I'm saying that you took what God allowed to happen in your life and learned the lesson that God allowed you to learn in that season so that the next time when that thing rolls around, I already took the course, God. I got it. I got it. I'm there. I got an A. I'm in. Have you learned from your past? Can I give you some encouragement? Allow, allow your past to fuel your future. If you learn the lesson, allow it to be fuel for your future. You want to overcome, you learn. You learn the lessons that God puts before you. Well, that just sounds intense. It is, like it is. I'm just being real, like it is. But there is great joy on the other side of those lessons even if there is heartache as you're walking through. Second thing is walk well. Walk well. Look at verse three. Verse three tells us, Saul, that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph, verse four, he found favor. Verse five says that from from that time he made him an overseer of the house. 
and over all that he'd had. The Lord blessed the Egyptian's house. For Joseph's sake, the blessing of the Lord was on all that he'd had in his house and on his field. At the very end of verse six says, and because of him, he had no concern about anything. Potiphar was rolling in it, not because of him, but because of a man under his care that walked well. Joseph had influence he had no business having. (laughs) God had elevated him into a position he had no legitimate reason even to be there. Why did that happen? Because he learned well. He got schooled by his past and he applied those lessons uh, to his life and he made following God something that wasn't like a a one-day-a-week deal. It wasn't just like one thing. It was like following God was a thing for me. That is my life. That is what I do. That's how I live. Like like for me and my family, we're gonna do this. We're gonna follow after God. We're gonna be faithful to him. We're not perfect, but we're gonna pursue Jesus with everything that we have. And I'm gonna learn those lessons and I'm gonna walk well. The New Testament reality for what I'm talking about is what Paul said to the church at Ephesus in Ephesus chapter four. He said, I urge you, I beg you, I'm asking, lean into this. Live a life worthy of the calling that you've received. Live a life worthy of the calling that you've received. Walk well, you're not going to be perfect, but walk in faithfulness to the Lord. And that's what Joseph did. He just leaned in, he walked well, he wasn't perfect, he didn't have everything together. I mean, listen, this guy was thrown in prison later, okay? Like everything wasn't like just awesome. But he walked faithfully and walked well. And what I want you to know about walking well is that walking well spills over onto other people. And we all know this intuitively. Why? Because when you wake up on the wrong side of the bed, what does your wife say to you, man? You woke up on the wrong side of the bed. Wow, you need to calm the dude. And then what happens is that you now set the tone for your whole home. And so she's slamming cabinets and your kids are elevated in their volume and you're wondering what is going on. You're what's going wrong. You set the tone. Interesting, isn't that? We know that intuitively, that just happens. The same thing happens with you and me spiritually. That what we're walking through in our lives and we're growing and working out our salvation, the scriptures tell us, and we're doing that in real life in front of other people, living life transparently in front of people, and we're saying, yeah, we struggle, but thank God we're forgiven from that struggle, and there's grace meeting us in this dark moment, and I'm living this in real time in front of you, and I'm letting you see me walk through this dark season. There is so much contagious things about somebody watching you and watching us live authentic, authentically following Christ in real time in front of them. And the Bible tells us that as Joseph walked well, that Potiphar experienced the favor of God not because of him, but because of Joseph. And what I want for your family, and what I want for my family, is for us to learn that walking well impacts people around us. And it points people to Jesus, ultimately. You want to overcome in your life? Let me just say this. Full-time follower. Full-time. Not a part-time follower of Christ, a full-time follower of Christ. Learning how to feed yourself through the scriptures, leaning into these moments just like this, and not just feeling the epicness of a moment. Man, this was great. The great music and the, yeah, there was this awesome spiritual crescendo. It's like they planned it that way or something. And then God showed up. Listen, those are awesome moments. But I'm talking about living Jesus full time, real time, all the time. And not expecting me or somebody else on this platform to spood feed you every day. If I only ate one day a week, I'd be a savage. And I think for many of us, that's where our hearts are spiritually, is when you feast on this, we think like we gorge ourselves and it's awesome and I love it and I love this. But our hearts cry for you is that this is a full-time deal. That man, you're digging into God's word today. Like, well, I was already at church. I did that today. I know, but it's real. And can I just tell you this? The more time we're in this, 
in, in God's word, can I tell you, this is something fascinating that I've seen in my own life. I feel like the luring of the enemy and the distraction of those things, it's like I don't see it anymore. It's like it's not even there because I've seen more of Jesus and experienced his goodness through his word and I've been satisfied in him and I don't buy the lie that that temptation is better than Jesus. Number three, refuse relentlessly. Let me hit this real quick. The scripture says that she was coming at him all the time, day after day. Verse eight says, but he refused. Circle that. (laughs) But he refused. It didn't matter how strong this woman was coming on to him. He refused relentlessly. I love what Charles Ryrie says about temptation. He says, temptation is to be avoided by fleeing, fleeing what hinders, by following what helps, and seeking the company of spiritual people. That is about as practical as it gets, y'all. You flee what hinders. Listen, if you know that fried chicken gives you heartburn, what do you stop doing? You stop eating fried chicken. And then if you still eat it, it's your own fault. So suck it up, buttercup, and get over it. And it's the same way with our lives. If we, like, like, listen, if we already know what hinders us, then do something drastic like Joseph. Run, man. Run. Break it with a hammer, tell somebody, and move on. Run. And some of you need to do something drastic right now. Why? Because your marriage hangs in the balance. Your relationships hang in the balance. That's why. And you've got to refuse relentlessly. Refusing becomes easier when we think about what's at stake. Trust is at stake. Potiphar gave Joseph everything he had. And if I were to sleep with his wife, it would violate all that trust. Think about for you, what trust is at stake in your life? Is it worth it? Can I tell you the answer? No. It's never worth it. Also, what's at stake is a violation of your beliefs. It was adultery to sleep with another man's wife. It would violate what God's best is for his life and for that marriage. The same is true in your temptation. I don't care what it is. You put whatever it is, It's a temptation because it's a violation of your core belief found in the Bible. That's at stake, violating what you believe. And then ultimately, it's a sin against God. When we choose to step out and lean into temptation, what we're doing is we're, there isn't a fracture in the relationship, but it feels fractured. Are you with me? There's no fracture, but it feels that way. How do I know that? Because I've sinned. Newsflash, I've sinned. And I've felt that separation on my human side. Spiritually, I was not separated from God, not one iota. But in that, God pursued me and called me back to himself. And I did feel that separation, but it was only in my, not in a spiritual sense, but in a felt practically separated. And that's what's at stake for us. And when we count the cost of that moment, It's causing you and me to stop. Do you understand that? I know sometimes temptation feels like a snowball running down a giant hill, right? And it's just gaining control and gaining control. But now that you know the process of what this thing looks like, maybe you can take a step back further and see this thing coming and go, long before I ever get there, I know that this thing has the ability to take me out. I've counted the cost, so I'm stepping back back here. And the line for me is back here. And then the last thing is this. You want to overcome? Ultimately, mute the monster. Potiphar's wife was a monster. Relentless in her pursuit of him. And the scripture tells us in verse 10, and she spoke to Joseph day after day and he would not listen. (laughs) He wouldn't listen. He wouldn't listen. He would not listen. One scholar says Joseph must have been endowed. That's a great word. Endowed with extraordinary power of the Spirit, seeing that he stood invincible to the last against 
all allurements. He stood there in the face of the gravest temptation that a man could ever face. And he stood right there looking at her square in the eye and said, no. And he could not do that in his own strength. He had the ability by the Spirit of God to stand in the face of that moment and say, because of God, no. And I've been thinking about you all week long. And I've been thinking about our church and saying, listen, if we could meet hope in the dark, it would be a group of people that could stare temptation, whatever it may be, right in the face. And the sucker punch to temptation is Jesus is better. He's better than this. He is better than this. He's more sustaining than this. And I choose today to lean into him and to say no to temptation, to fight that, to kill the beast of my flesh, mute the monster of temptation, and to say no because of Christ. So then what did Joseph get because he did this? You know what he got? He got wrath. Verse 19 tells us that Potiphar, his anger kindled against him. That's wrath. You mean to tell me he did all the right things and got wrath? I am telling you that. What else did he get? Prison. Verse 20 says Potiphar was so ticked off he threw him in prison. He did all that right and he got wrath and he got prison. Yes. Why are you telling me this? Because it's real. Because Joseph knew the reality that I would rather be in a physical prison with the presence of God Almighty, freedom from my sin, than to be free in the world and to live in spiritual prison in my life. The Bible tells us in verse 20, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Verse 23 says, the Lord was with him and whatever he did, the Lord make made succeed. What I'm telling you is what I want me to remember and want us to remember is that we would, listen, I want us to rather live in a prison physically shackled with the physical chains, rather live that way than to be shackled to the spiritual chains that we're carrying around in our lives. And that sin doesn't own you anymore. Jesus owns you by, the shed blood, by his own shed blood. You were bought with a price and you are not your own. You are his. I love what Jeremiah says. He said, listen, for many of us today, we go, man, I, 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 listen, I am not strong enough to do what Joseph did. And you are correct. The prophet Jeremiah says, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? Is anything too hard for God? Is anything too hard for God? Like anything. Is anything too hard for the Lord? No, nothing is too hard for God. And I know you might feel like running out right now, but I'm telling you right now, listen, you need to do business right now with God. And the heart cry of this church should be this, God, I need you now (laughs) because I am fully capable of blowing this now. And we need your hope to meet us in this moment. We've learned about the technique of temptation, but we also now are armed with the offensive weapon of how to overcome it. And by God's grace and by his strength, you and I now can be overcomers. And that overcoming can spill off and you can find favor in your family, in your business, with the influence that you have. God can leverage your overcoming and people can experience overcoming just by being around you. God, we ask you now just to give us a moment to reflect, to do business, to call out to you. And God, I recognize that when you do a talk like this, it's, 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 it's not like getting ice cream. It's not like the, you know, getting to go to Disneyland. But what we do know is that it is real. And this is life. And God, it's because of our faithfulness to you and to your word that we want to teach this. And God, I pray that we would experience your hope today. I know there are many of you here today that are walking in circumstances I can't even imagine and fathom. 
And what I want you to know is that Jesus knows even though I don't know. And that what is called for you in this moment is very, very simple. It's a call to surrender. You're a believer in Christ, but you need to lay that down at his feet. And you offer that to him. And in offering that to him, I'm telling you right now, you will experience forgiveness and freedom. And I want you to revel in the reality that you are loved, forgiven, and freed by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And as we sing today, I want you to express that gratitude to God. There are others of you, you're going to fight this temptation today to be in control. And God is chasing after you in love, not because he's mad, but in love. And what he wants for you, you want victory from your life. And the only way to experience true victory in your life is to lay down your life in exchange for his. That's called the gospel. Jesus in your place. He did what you could not do. You can't overcome that sin, but he can. And by your express faith and trust in him, you receive forgiveness, the power of the Holy Spirit in you to live no longer chained and shackled to that sin, but chained and shackled to the love, mercy, grace, and forgiveness of Jesus. If you've never, hear me church, if you've never expressed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I want to give you a chance to do that right now. Would you just raise your hand and say, I've never prayed to receive Christ. And today, I want to be forgiven of my sins and I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Would you just lift your hand up right now? If you've never done that, I want to give you a chance to do it right now. God, we need you today.